Hello, well here I am talking to you from the Arts Library building this afternoon. Uh, I thought I'd have a change of location for this insolvency short. Uh, and what I want to talk to you about today is a very important case for creditors who have attempted to priority gain. So they've tried to cause themselves to have a better position in an insolvency environment. And that species of creditor are, of course, football creditors. Because the case I want to talk to you about is Revenue and Customs Commissioners and Football League Limited and another. The citation is 2012 square brackets, England and Wales High Court, page 1372 Chancery. And it's a judgment of Mr Justice Richards, David Richards, as he then was, now of course Lord Justice David Richards. The facts briefly stated are this. You had the Football League, which was itself a company, and it employed a complicated group structure below it in the sense of the football clubs that were in the Football League, where each one of those clubs had a share in the Football League itself, in the company, the juristic person that the Football League used to administrate this league structure. And then in turn, each one of those clubs having a share would also use and employ a company form. And those company forms were the conduit through which revenue would be pumped from the Football League company, the, 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 in essence, a parent company. So gate receipts, advertising revenue, etc. would all flow through these companies that each football club employed, for example, Crystal Palace or Watford or some other football club that was in the Football League at the given time. The problem for us was that, or the, the creditors generally, was that these structures were used in such a way as to cause on an insolvent event the distribution that would normally occur pursuant to the Insolvency Acts to be subverted. Why? Well, because the Football League, as part of its insolvency policy, had in place a system whereby a group of creditors, known as football creditors, would be paid in priority to all other species of creditors. Uh, one example of this, of course, could be a football player. So you'd have an anomalous position where the remuneration of a million pound football player, millions of pounds in football player fees, would be paid to that player in priority to a cleaner at a football club that had gone into an insolvency procedure. That's one example. Other football creditors were, in addition to players, other football clubs, the Football League itself, uh, the football administrative bodies like the FA and so on. So this little tranche of creditors would get a form of super priority status. But as you know, following the Enterprise Act 2002, HMRC dropped from being a preferential creditor down into the unsecured creditor bracket. So when the HMRC see mechanisms like this being used to attack that hierarchy, the waterfall of distribution, so as to be able to uh, diminish their position, HMRC's position, they're going to go on the attack. They're going to argue that these various devices are invalid, such as this Football League creditor prioritisation technique. And that's exactly what they did. So that's why we see the Revenue and Customs Commission is bringing this case in the Chancery Division before uh, David Richards, Mr Justice Richards, uh, as he then was, uh, when they argue that these approaches by the Football League subverted both the anti-deprivation principle and the pari passu principle, two fundamental, so-called fundamental concepts of insolvency law. In short, David Richards, after an exhaustive judgment, held that this Football League system did not offend the pari passu principle. Why? Well, because pari passu only operates on distribution, not as part of some rescue package like a company voluntary arrangement or administration. And of course, in this instance, where up until 2016 anyway, football clubs were caused to use CVAs, company voluntary arrangements, as part of their process of insolvency management, there would be no distribution. Of course, we know now that administration has, as part of its 
aims and objectives, distribution, so the question of distribution, therefore pari passu, could arise in that context. But here, at this time, when we were talking about actually a hypothetical case, because there were no football clubs involved who were insolvent, but a set of facts that would require an insolvency procedure to be extant that was using distribution mechanisms and therefore pari passu principles needed to be afoot. It wasn't here, we were still in a rescue phase and therefore David Richards held that these approaches were fine, they were satisfactory. In this instance, another judgment, another case would be needed for him to be able to, or another judge, for them to be able to say whether or not this subversion of so-called equality of treatment, which we know doesn't really exist anyway, was what was happening with these football creditors. Only on planet football could you get such a, an anomalous position, you might argue. If you want to look at some secondary sources, Professor Ian F. Fletcher, if you see has written a long article on the subject uh, in Insolvency Intelligence, so have a look at that. Similarly, Professor McCormack up at Leeds, he's written on the football creditor issue before this judgment in relation, in relation to Southampton and some other football clubs, Portsmouth, etc. Have a look at his article, Jerry McCormack's work. Um, but most importantly, when you're looking at the case, Think about it in two ways. One, as an example of an attack on pari passu distribution, and in the other way, think of it as an example of the use of the CVA in the context of a rescue environment. Enjoy the case. From here in the Arts Library, I bid you goodbye.